Right. Good morning, all. So, uh, let's resume our discussion on uh, ground granulated plasminous slag. In the last class, we were talking about uh, the hydration of slag. Hydration is enabled by activation. This activation can happen with the help of alkalis or sulfates, but when it is used in combination with cement, the activation is with the help of both alkali and sulfate which are provided by the cement, right. So, mixed activation is what we typically have. As I said, slag also has a high magnesium. So, generally a number of phases in slag are basically calcium, magnesium, aluminum silicates complex phases which have both calcium which have, which have all these elements present calcium aluminum magnesium silica right the difficulty with these phases is that because of magnesium the solubility of these phases becomes very limited right so the greater the amount of free amorphous silica that is present the faster will be the reactivity but for these phases getting them to react in any short period of time is very difficult it's only a long term process and by then your water available for curing or water available for hydration will have already got depleted mostly. Okay. So, most of the reaction will happen because of the amorphous uh, phases that are present. All the slag is amorphous, but then this amorphous phases containing magnesium are not that easy to come into solution and undergo the reaction because of which you will generally find slag concretes uh, as having many unhydrated particles of calcium magnesium silicate phases. Now, in terms of how slag affects concrete properties, it is not very difficult to visualize that because your slag reaction is slower, there will be a delayed rate of strength development. Uh, apart from that, you will really not see too much effect on fresh concrete properties when cement is replaced by slag. But one thing that may happen, please remember slag is a ground version of the granulated slag that comes out after quenching the molten slag. Now, when you grind it, these particles become highly angular. Of course, cement grains are also angular, but please remember that slag is much harder than cement. We talked about it from the perspective of intergrinding versus interblending. So, because of this hardness, these slag particles can actually increase the harshness of your system. So, when you are trying to pump slag concrete through a pipe, the frictional resistance offered by the concrete will be more. And people have reported from the site that when slag concrete is used, the pipes seem to get worn out much faster as compared to plain cement concrete. So, you are basically pumping a harder material. So, wear and tear of the pipe is going to be much more. Okay? So, that is one thing to keep in mind when you are trying to use slag concrete for pumpability, try to design it with a slightly higher slump so that you can reduce this extent of wear and tear on the pipe. Alternatively, we can use an admixture such as what kind of admixture should we use if you want to push concrete easily through a pipe without too much resistance, viscosity modifying agent VMA can be used. In such instances when VMA basically helps in pumping, it is also known as a pumping aid. VMA is also called pumping aid when it is used primarily for the purposes of making pumping easier. So, slag concrete is difficult to pump because of the wear and tear increase of the pipe because of hard slag particles and you can make it easier by designing with a higher slump or using a VMA. Now, when you talk about continuous curing, the ultimate strengths with slag will be generally improved and durability, we already talked briefly about that earlier that because of the presence of alumina, there is a large proportion of binding of chlorides that actually happens and because of this in marine environments, slag concrete is almost always the material of choice, almost always, right? Uh, more often than not, people will be using slag concrete in marine environments. Now, some aspects of hydration are presented here. Now, uh, there is some reactive silica, so portal dead consumption may be there, but please remember that slag has enough calcium on its own 
the decrease in calcium hydroxide content or portland red content with the presence of slag is not going to be as substantial as with other active aluminosilicates let us say like calcium clay. Okay. So, here this is actually a, a model for hydration which is called the GEMS model or Gibbs free energy minimization model. Uh, it is a model that, that has been put forward based on how the thermodynamics of the system evolves and what are the possibilities of the products that could form from a given mixture of reactants. So, here they are talking about slag, portlandite, ettringite, I mean whatever remains in the first phases of cement hydration. So, with time your formation right, or with the increase in slag content, the formation of CSH is going up. Okay. But because a lot of slag is not going to react, there will be still very high amounts of unreacted slag when you obviously have a greater amount of slag in your mix. Okay. You consume calcium hydroxide to some extent and you see that the calcium hydroxide content is continuously reducing as you go to higher slag replacements. But very often in actual experimental evidence, this is a thermodynamic model. Okay. This is basically the, if equilibrium is attained in this reaction, what are the what is the potential for the product formation. But in reality, all this may not actually happen, right. Your unreacted slag may be much more than what is predicted. Your calcium hydroxide depletion may be much less as compared to what is predicted by the thermodynamic model. Uh, generally, ettringite will get converted to monosulphate more in a slag concrete or a flash concrete. Why? Because why does this happen? Why do you expect more conversion of ettringite to monosulphate? Sorry, there is more alumina present, right. So, alumina silica balance is going to get affected when you replace cement by slag. Very often, when we prepare blended cements, we ensure that we modify the sulphate content also to really make it suitable to be used with the aluminosilicate mineral admixture. So, sulphate optimization is often done whenever mineral admixtures are used to ensure that we do not get too much of a change in the balance. And the sulphate optimization also helps you to attain the early strengths. Early strengths you know the uh, partially because of ettringite formation right and that you can obtain by doing some sulphate optimization. There are other phases that could also form in the system calcium aluminoferrite hydrates, hydrotalcite, hemicarbonate could form in some instances or monocarbonate could also form provided there is some calcite available in the system or calcium carbonate available in the system. Okay, because there is alumina from your slag, there is carbonate from your calcite or limestone and that can combine to form carboaluminates right. Just like what we discussed earlier, carboaluminates are forming when you have alumina and calcium carbonate in the presence of portlandite calcium hydroxide. Okay. Now, this is uh, an, a result from mercury intrusion porosimetry, mercury intrusion porosimetry. So, in this experiment what is done is you take a sample of your hardened cement paste or cement mortar and subject that to continuously increasing pressures of mercury. So, you put it inside, immerse it in mercury and pressurize the mercury to get into the pores. Mercury is chosen in this experiment because it does not wet the surfaces, it is a non-wetting liquid. It has a obtuse contact angle if you remember your surface chemistry. So, mercury is able to penetrate the pores without getting stuck to the pores. So, the higher the pressure, the smaller will be the diameter of the pores that the mercury, mercury will penetrate. So, you can actually get a range of pore sizes from this experiment called mercury intrusion porosimetry. So, here what they are saying is as the hydration time increases, the critical radius that means the radius exhibited by majority of your pores continuously reduces. Why? Because more and more hydration is happening. So, more pores are getting filled up. When pores start getting filled up with CSH, they become smaller and smaller. And what you can clearly see is for Portland cement, there is some extent of reduction that happens, but with slag and fly ash, this reduction in your critical radius of the pore keeps increasing 
or reduction creeps in grease that means the pore size keeps reducing as hydration proceeds further ok. So, and generally it may happen that you will not be able to reduce the pore size beyond a certain limit because it is not physically possible to continue the hydration beyond a certain point okay. there is not enough space for the hydrated materials to start growing. So, your hydrated materials need some space to start nucleating and growing and that is not going to happen if your pores become smaller and smaller. And generally slag will reach lower pore size at early ages compared to fly ashes, why? You can see from here that slag is the red curve, it the lowering of pore sizes in slag is faster than in fly ash because of higher reactivity of slag right because of higher reactivity of slag fly ash is not as reactive so it takes some time so you need to give prolonged curing for fly ash reactivity to continue happening but up after a certain period of time it's almost going to be at the same level of critical pore size as the slag mix and both these concretes may have a smaller pore size compared to the plain cement mix. Now, this is an, uh, a result from University of Cape Town and this talks about the durability of slag cements in terms of a durability parameter called chloride conductivity. So, in this experiment what is typically done is you have two electrodes and you have a concrete sample setting between the two electrodes, sample is like a disc of concrete setting between two electrodes and both sides are having saturated sodium chloride solution. The concrete also is completely saturated in sodium chloride solution. This is a little bit different as compared to the rapid chloride permeability test that I discussed earlier. So, here you do not want your chlorides to diffuse anymore, but you fill up your pores with chloride and then you apply a voltage, you apply a potential difference between the two electrodes and measure the current you measure the current and determine the conductivity ok. So, all you are doing is determining conductivity of the system which is completely saturated with sodium chloride. So, there is no transport of chlorides that is happening in this experiment, it is only a transport of charge that is happening. Why is that important? What does it tell us? Transport of charge, if the pores are highly connected there will be more charge passing, if the pores are less connected there will be less charge passing that is it. So, here chloride conductivity of plain cement you see that it is about 1 milli siemens per centimeter, but as you use your mineral additives like for instance this is a 50 50 blend of cement and slag 65 35 and 80 20, you can clearly see that there is a reduction in your conductivity when slag is used. So, that clearly shows that you have much better resistance ionic penetration or better resistance implying a more interconnected or less interconnected pore network ok. There is a less interconnected pore network in the case of slag and you can see that depending upon the type of slag there are three slags that were tried blast furnace slag, corex slag and another ferromanganese arc furnace slag. So, in this case you can see that the corex slag which is the second one in the series seems to have fairly good activity ok, but the blast furnace slag is essentially more or less the best at least in the case of the 65 35 blend and the 80 20 blend, but in 50 50 you see a slightly better result with corex slag, but your ferromanganese arc slag is not really giving you a very good result in this experiment. But in general the chloride resistance is better as compared to your plain Portland cement mixture. Now, we talked already about this briefly earlier that uh, when you replace cement with any mineral additive your carbonation is likely to increase because you have less ca calcium hydroxide present as an alkaline buffer that can combine with carbon dioxide to form calcium carbonate that forms a layer on the surface and prevents easy entry of CO2 into the concrete. But generally with increased amount of cement replacement by fly ash or slag you expect that your carbonation depth will go up ok. So, generally here what you see is increase in carbonation with respect to Portland cement when fly ash is used at 20 percent 
the increase is about 30 percent. That means, if the carbonation depth with plain Portland cement is 20 millimeters with slag sorry with fly ash at 20 percent it will be 26 millimeters. So, 30 percent increase is happening ok. But what you see is at high volumes of slag you are getting a 90 percent replacement uh, sorry 90 percent increase in carbonation depth when you use 60 percent cement replacement by fly ash. Slag generally the numbers are smaller you see that at 20 percent you hardly get any major increase. But when it comes to the typical slag mix that is 50 percent replacement you get a 60 percent increase in carbonation depth and that is substantial that could be substantial ok. Now, in IIT we had a long term study uh, done in conjunction with uh, Lafarge ok, Lafarge Holsem that is. So, uh, this study involved uh, natural carbonation our exposure site was essentially the terrace of BSB we kept specimens on the terrace of BSB. And from time to time after 1 year, 2 year, 3 years, 5 years and so on we have extracted these specimens and checked the depth of carbonation in these specimens. So, what you see here is after 3 years of natural carbonation what is the natural carbonation uh, or CO2 uh, concentration approximate CO2 concentration natural environment 0 0.04 percent or 400 parts per million what is the uh, carbonation or CO2 environment in this room obviously more right. So, it depends on the number of people sitting inside it depends on the kind of air circulation that we have because of air conditioning right and that is one reason why you start feeling sleepy in an air conditioned room depending upon the type of air conditioner if there, there is no if the air exchange is not sufficient the CO2 content basically goes up it increases your drowsiness of course. There are many other reasons that cause you to sleep, but that is one of the reasons at least we teachers like to believe that is the reason that you are sleeping. Anyway, so this result is presenting the comparison of OPC and OPC replaced with 30 percent slag and with 30 percent class C fly ash. So, high calcium fly ash system. So, you see that there is some increase as you go from cement to slag to fly ash, but if you check the scatter it is not tremendous it is not really such a huge increase that you see. The same experiment when you conduct it in an accelerated carbonation environment accelerated means people try to increase the CO2 concentration and fix the humidity in such a condition that the rate of penetration is maximum. So, generally RH for accelerated conditions RH is typically around 60 percent and your CO2 is around 1 to 3 percent. So, that means you are going significantly higher than atmospheric carbonation when you do accelerated carbonation. So, when you read papers with carbonation measurements make sure you understand what is the condition that has been adopted for measurement of carbonation. Not everybody can afford to do a natural carbonation imagine if you are doing a PhD if you do a natural carbonation test and stay for 5 years just to measure 3 or 4 sets of data you are basically done right it has to be done over several PhDs. Uh, so, that is why people adopt accelerated means of testing because accelerated testing can get over in a matter of 4 to 5 months even if it is accelerated it takes 4 months right. That also tells you that if you really have to check carbonation resistance of a concrete for a construction project you need to have at least 6 months to do your mixed design not many people allow you to do that ok anyway. So, at similar strength grade between fly ash and slag concrete mixes carbonation of slag concrete is lesser than that of fly ash concrete at the same strength grade levels. That is also important to consider when a structural engineer tells the concrete producer that a particular strength concrete is required you can design for that particular strength with different combinations of additives different combinations of additives. So, what the design is supposed to satisfy is that the strength at 28 days should be met or if there is an early strength requirement that also needs to be met. But what happens is then you start comparing at an equivalent strength level at an equivalent strength level. This study here however, has been done at an equivalent binder content and water binder ratio. So, there is a difference 
in results when you do studies at equivalent water binder ratio and binder content or if you do the study at equivalent strength. Why do I say this? When you do the 30 percent uh, class C fly ash mix, okay, obtaining the same strength as that of an OPC mix may require you to get a lower water disseminate ratio because this is 28 days strength we are talking about, right. Uh, well, this is class C fly ash, so maybe 28 days it may become equal. Class F, imagine if you have class F fly ash, you may want to go for a lower water to binder ratio to get that same strength. Now, when you start checking the rate of carbonation at equivalent strength levels is when you will get the correct picture of what is going on when cement is replaced by fly ash or slime. So, it is very important to again be careful about what you are reading in papers so that you can get a clear estimate of what is going to happen in your actual construction project. Now, we not only did carbonation, but we did a whole range of other durability studies ranging from chloride based tests to gas penetration tests to water penetration tests. So, all of these tests were conducted over this long term study. This was over a period of uh, 2 years that we actually did this study. The idea was to see what kind of limiting values we need to propose for construction projects when concrete mixtures have these mineral additives. How do we control? quality of concrete based on durability. So, I am not going to go through the details of these test methods because that is not really the, uh, the, the scope of this course, but I will give you some results, uh, general results. So, here what is presented is test results across the entire range of binder content and water binder ratio. Over this study, we had nearly about 40 to 45 concrete mixes which had varying degrees of binder content and water binder ratio and replacement levels of supplementary cementing material. So, what you see here, the surface resistivity measurement is typically done in a moist concrete and you are basically trying to assess the properties of the cover concrete by passing a current and then measuring the potential difference and converting that to the resistivity of the concrete. Okay. In this kind of a test, what you see that as you increase the supplementary cementing material, your resistivity is going up. What implications does this have on your durability? If your resistivity is higher, what does that talk about your durability? Durability goes up, why? Because, so resistivity is the inverse of conductivity. So, the less conductive the material, it indicates that the pore structure is less interconnected, right. So, resistivity is a good measure for quality assessment of concrete mixtures with respect to durability and what you see here is that as you increase replacement level, your resistivity is going up. But what does that indicate? Does it always indicate higher durability or could it be because of some other reasons also? Same thing, opposite you are talking about total charge passed in the rapid chloride penetration test. As you increase the replacement level, the charge passed drops. In other words, the conductivity of the system is going down. But is this only because of improved durability or could there be something else contributing to this result? We talked about this when we had a discussion on silica fume. What happens when you replace cement by siliceous mineral additives or glassy or amorphous mineral additives? Why would it have an impact on conductivity? Because it starts binding the alkali ions. The siliceous phases bind the alkali ions, lower the overall concentration of ion ionic species in your pore solution. What does that do? Obviously, it will lower the conductivity of the pore solution that is present in the concrete, right. We talked about this silica fume always does well in the rapid chloride penetration test and that is why the promoters of silica fume always used RCPT to show the result and never other durability tests and that is why this test has become so popular all across the world. In any case, partly the result is also due to the fact that your cement is getting diluted, so you do not have as much alkali present in your system. Alkali loading of your system has come down, so pore solution has become less concentrated with respect to ionic species. Okay, what does your pore solution have? It has sodium, 
potassium and to balance that what is the other ionic species present in the pore solution? To balance you need to have a negatively charged species, what should that be? OH minus yeah. So, you have sodium, potassium and OH minus, you may have some calcium, but not too much. Generally in your pore solution, this is what will be the concentration in the long term. So, how do you extract pore solution? You just have to compress your concrete with a great deal of pressure, triaxial compression has to be done and then you will be able to extract the pore solution. You can analyze that for pH, you can analyze that for your concentration of these species and you will find that whenever cement is replaced by mineral additives, the content of sodium and potassium is coming down. But what about hydroxyl? It is a balancing species, right? So, if the positive species comes down, the negative also will come down. There will not be too much of stabilization and in any case, you are also consuming your calcium hydroxide, right? So, the net charge balance is such that your pore solution becomes less conductive. So, some of these results that rely on electrical methods need to be looked at carefully to possibly see the influence of this lowered conductivity of the system. Now, what is interesting here is that since RCPT is often used for durability level assessment of concrete mixtures, it is interesting to see that even at uh, 0 percent replacement, that means with plain Portland cement, we are able to get between 1000 and 2000 RCPT value, but this is with 400 kilogram binder and 0 0.4 water to binder ratio. So, what approximate grade of concrete could this be? 400 kilogram binder and 0.4 water cement ratio, maybe this will be around M35. 240. Okay. Of course, in laboratory studies with the Chennai materials, this will produce about 40 MPa, but in the field, we can think of that as an M35 mix. Now, what is interesting to see is that you are able to produce even lower chloride permeabilities at 50 percent replacement for mixtures that have binder content 310 and water binder ratio 0.5. So, we are talking about M20 to M25 mixes here, M20 to M25, which is typically used for your residential construction. So, what does this go to show? What is the primary impact of this result? What is the primary impact? When you use only Portland cement to get higher durability, you need to go for higher strength. But when you use blended cements, you can get good durability even at low to moderate strength levels. That is the major impact of this result is that you can prove now that for concrete mixtures which have blended cements, you will get decent level of durability even with lower grade of concrete. But all of this is assuming you are doing adequate curing, okay. that is the main aspect here. You need to do adequate curing, without which you are not going to get this result. Water softivity result also indicates that at 28 days, there is not that much of a difference, but at 90 days, you clearly see that the water softivity level is reduced when higher levels of cement replacement are done. Again, it goes to show the impact of extended curing on concretes with mineral admixtures.